Welcome back to Film Music Focus. Today we have the immense pleasure of composer John Debney, who, as you all know, is not only one of the most prolific composers in the industry, but he's also managed to survive nearly 40 years of this industry, which is no small feat. And it is such a pleasure to have you here, Mr. Debney. Welcome. How are you today? I'm good, Justin. How are you? I'm uh, probably like you. You know, I'm I'm growing a little bit of the beard. (laughs) Yeah. The hair's long, no haircut, but anyway, it's all great. It's it's all good, and it's just great to be with you today. It's a departure from kind of the norm. These last six weeks have been, um, I guess, a kind way of saying it's just bizarre. You know, it, at minimum, it's been bizarre. Yeah, it's bizarre, and, um, you know, I've been lucky enough and fortunate enough to sort of be working through this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were laughing about it today, you know, when, when things come back, as we know they will. Right. Um, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of excitement and I'll be the first one to celebrate. <laughs> but, you know, I've been just working kind of 24-7. So uh, I think when we do get back to a normal, yeah, it'll be uh, a little, it won't, <laughs> won't be as exciting for me. Cause I'll just be back at work. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. again, I'm, I'm really fortunate cause a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people are hurting out there and I'm just, you know, so fortunate and grateful to be working on a couple of projects. Great. Well, we will um, be excited to see what the next few things coming out with you are. I, uh, I, I, I've spent years. I mean, I was, I guess the first time I heard your music was in, uh, my second year of high school, so I was a sophomore in high school, and it was um, an eye opener for me for that that particular film that I watched, which we'll get to in a moment. The Cutthroat Island that was in I think ninety five, oh. which was my sophomore year in high school, and yeah. so um, hearing that swashbuckling swagger, um, you know, from the music and certainly the the accompanying visuals, it. it was refreshing to hear at, at that very young age, at age 15, that that tradition, that um, Errol Flynn tradition is still well and alive, as I thought to myself in 1995. And, and you know, it's been so many decades already after, and um, we still all follow so much of what you put out there. And that the, the topic of output, you know, I think is one that um, perhaps we can talk a bit more as, as we progress here today. But... Um, sure. No small feat, as I said at the beginning of the episode here, um, the sheer output and just the ability to survive and reinvent yourself as an artist in this industry. Um, mm-hmm. Why don't we start just a little bit with that? Because I think that's an important element to keep in mind for young artists that are either starting out in this industry or already are in this industry. Well, sure. Well, thank you for those kind words. Um, you know, Cutthroat Island, I was probably about 30 three or four, uh, not sure, right in there somewhere. And it was a kind of fluke Mm. that I received the gift of doing that film because uh, Rennie Harlan, the director, had heard some of my music unbeknownst to me. And Uh. uh, that's the way that one came in. And I think he was looking for somebody that, you know, could, could do orchestral sort of traditional orchestral music and you know i was god i was a young kid i was like your age so um it was a big huge bonanza of yeah. like, you know of of a, a gift of rich a great riches to be able to yeah. you know just dream big and just write the biggest music i could write yeah. um by then i was i was a seasoned composer pretty much i was I had done a lot of television mm-hmm. and a lot of um, theme park uh, kind of scores that that enabled me to have a, a pretty cool traditional orchestral reel. And I guess that's why Rennie was sort of drawn to it. And mm-hmm. we became good friends and we had to kind of do it quickly. And and then all of a sudden we were in London, you know, with the LSO, with a hundred piece orchestra at, at Air Studios. And 
uh, with a lot of sessions. We did a lot of sessions, like two and a half hours, three hours of music ish. And, um, and we had a big choir and it was just a dream come true. And it's kind of a blur, but (laughs) it was somebody, I remember at the time somebody had mentioned that the JW John Williams was perhaps around you would know this actually, Justin. Um, was he around 34, 35 when he did Star Wars, the first one? He was 45, 45 years old when uh, start 1977 came along. Yeah. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, then he was older than I was at, you know, but there was some, in my own mind, I guess I compared, you know, that I had done this sort of ra- rather major, you know, swashbuckling score at a time when uh, I, I was a, young guy so i'm i mean i could have the time wrong i don't know if it's 34 or i was 36 ish somewhere somewhere around there i think mm-hmm. that I, mm-hmm. well you um i mean well i mean just this this one i, I the main title correct me if i'm wrong i think the main title is an a minor mm-hmm. and then we go to d mm-hmm. yeah i mean so- right right there it's just it it, it pivots and the way it's orchestrated, and I talk a lot about this um, with some of the programs that we share through Cine Concerts, and that is that mm-hmm. what you hear on the piano, this kind of two things, you know, if, if it sounds pretty good on the piano, when I say pretty good, you know, that's a wide range of, of opinion. It, yeah. it can sound pretty good in the orchestra if you know how to orchestrate it properly. And and this, 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 yeah. I, this idea of taking something even, you know, some, and what do you do with that? And you, you made it so heroic through the orchestration, through the tempi, um, and certainly the way it was married to the visuals. I um, mean, right away in this film, um, you're given a great sense of adventure. So you mentioned television before yep. you got to here. Let's pivot backwards just a couple of years. Um, I think 1993, mm-hmm. which was one of my favorite television shows at the time, Sequest DSV, um, mm-hmm. which I guess is also known as Sequest 2032, which I didn't know until recently. Is that right? Here, yeah here's the thing um it was just sequest when i when i took it over now that was a period of time where i was having such fun i you know was doing things for for steven spielberg mm-hmm. that being one of them right uh i'd done a pilot for steven called the class of 61 that's, which was a right. civil war that's thing. Right. yeah and that never you know didn't sell but Nonetheless, um, we sort of developed a, a friendship, a relationship. And so when Sequest came along, he called me for that. And so I did do the first year, year and a half, like the first season, part of the second season. And then I, because of these films, I was so fortunate enough mm-hmm. to start getting film work. Um, so I had to, you know, sort of jump off Sequest to do cutthroat island mm-hmm. and i think hocus pocus somewhere around right, there right um but yeah it was just a a blur of a wonderful time for yeah me. you know i was just so i don't know why justin you know we're all sometimes it's luck and fate and yeah. you know you have to be prepared for the um you know the opportunities but um that was an, a really fun time uh, I'd been married, you know, a few years. We were, mm. we had kids on the yeah, way. Yeah. I have three boys. And, uh, so it was just kind of a great creative, crazy time. Yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, Sequest, uh, the next iteration, it, it became a little bit different show with different producers and I was gone from it by then. And I think yeah. my friend Don Davis took over for a little bit Right. and another chap took, took over after that. But yeah. um, fun days, fun days. <laughs> Let's take a look at um, uh, an interesting choice. It might might be called uh, for for Cutthroat Island. But I love this little tiny scene um, because of where you decided to stop the music, and okay. and I I think that um, there's there's a lesson to be learned here about not trying to overshadow perhaps what's going on on the screen. And one of the other reasons I love this little tiny scene is because it arguably might be one of the biggest explosions in you know movie history <laughs> even all these years later with cgi
at minimum, there's entertainment value watching that explosion over and over and over. Um, but I, I, I think Love there it. there is a lesson there in in where you stop the music, and that was um, an obviously a very intentional point um, that either came from I, I mean I don't know just a spotting session initially or a trial and error with you and your director, but um, that that's a, a, a very impactful moment perhaps even more so because where you decided not to put music. Well, honestly, I think uh, that piece of music was quite long. And was it? We did it in a few sections. And I think, honestly, to be honest, I think I convinced Rennie Harlan to let me get out of music because I said, there's no way, Rennie, you're going to hear this. <laughs> you're not going to hear music through that explosion. Yeah. And he he listened to me, which was very cool. Yeah. Um, and there was another place in the movie, I remember we did that too, where there was a big storm at sea and, um, you know, I knew you weren't going to hear much music at, at one point. And yeah. so we did take the music out, but yeah, yeah that's, um, you know, that, that scene with the explosion, I sort of had to play into it and then let the explosion be the, uh, sure. the coda or the, the period on it. So yeah. it's, that's what that was about. Well, that, but I, you know, I convinced them, I think to, to take out the music there, which I thought was good. Well, that's part of the, the process, you know, and the, the collaborative spirit with which exists. And certainly, you're no stranger to it because you wouldn't be as successful as you've been over these decades unless you understood how to manage collaborative challenges. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's something that, that is, is worth talking about, even maybe perhaps just for a moment, is... Um, oh, sure. Well, you know, it's you can have a great trusting yeah. relationship with someone, but there's still... There's going to be a creative rub to some degree, which is good. It makes makes it for a good, yeah. you know. Well, it does, and I, I don't know why I'm. Boy, that's. I mean, we could do a whole class on yeah, collaboration and and how that works. And um, but honestly, I just, I guess my personality is such is that I I don't know. There's something funny about me. Like I love to hear other ideas. I love I love yeah. to collaborate. You know, and I, I don't. Some people, I guess, like it better than than others, but I love to hear what's in a filmmaker's mind, mm -hmm. and I love to get in their mind if I can, uh, he or she, and sort of try to figure out yeah. the puzzle that is a film score. So, um, you know, I've never been one. We 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 as composers or any artists have to deal with people that have opinions, good, bad, ugly, right. you know, in, indifferent, and. Um, I don't know. There's something about me where I can get perhaps beat down, you know, and then get a good night's sleep and get up and I'm kind of raring to go. And uh, my friend, Bruce Broughton, uh, the wonderful, illustrious, our friend, Bruce Broughton, yeah. used to call me the, it's, I think he still does, calls me the Everetti bunny. You know? <laughs> I didn't know that. That's funny. That's, <laughs> yeah. He that sounds like Bruce. Because yeah. he just goes, how do you, you know, We've done a few things together, and yeah. I, it's always a joy working with him. And and uh, sometimes he'll, he'll turn to me and go, "You're like the Ever Ready Bunny." He yeah. he he dubbed me that years ago, and I and I love it. It's sort of endearing to yeah. me, like you know, like where where he's sort of ah, well, he's done with it, and I, I'm sort of well, let's go, Bruce, let's, let's go. do it again, you know. So it's kind of wild like that, but yeah. I think it's all kind of a personality. Mm -hmm. thing um oops hold on one sec i lost you for, okay i'm back um i think it's who you are as a person it's sort of yeah. how you navigate and you must do the same thing justin you deal with all kinds of orchestras and ensembles and and uh you know the the political <laughs> scene of it all and you have to navigate it and you have to kind of yeah you know let it slide off your back and kind of go okay you know yeah it's and, true and, uh, for whatever reason, I, I guess I have that knack and I'm glad I have it because I probably, you know, would, would, have, got, would have quit a long time ago. Yeah. I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, I love what I do, but yeah. you know what I'm saying. I do. And, you know, it's it's an interesting um, maturation process that comes along with having to deal with that, you know, both emotionally, psychologically, just as a human being. And, and you know, I think it's 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 worth kind of pointing out that the more and more you do of it, obviously the better you could potentially get at it. But I, I recall even just for me 20 years ago, I mean, I had a really rather nasty experience with a young director at the time. And it was one of those moments where 
you know, I'm sure you can relate to something along these lines, but he you know, was berating me in front of the orchestra. Literally on the stage, he came and interrupt, oh, well, or, or interrupted the red light and starts yelling at me well, about... That's not okay. No, well, not okay. no, no. And certainly at the age of 20, I didn't know what to do. And, and finally, I just kind of decided to burn the bridge. And he was, you know, screaming about how he hated oboes and why did I write oboes? And after, you know, two or three weeks of this, I finally said to him, I knew I'd burned the bridge, but I said, you know, look, I'm sorry, but there aren't any oboes on the stage. There aren't any woodwinds on the stage. Um, you know, <laughs> it was one of those moments where he got so angry at me. For those some, are tough moments, yeah. you know, I, I have to say, and, yeah. and I'm sure just in life in general, yeah. I don't, you know, I, I can take a lot of sort of big personality, you know, I yeah. dealt with them all. Uh, and I'm they're sure. all friends of mine, actually, you know, yeah. they're all people I love Mel Gibson and, yeah. Ivan Reitman come to mind. They're very strong personalities, and and that's why they're so talented. I think. Yeah. But I think there's a you know I I've, I've rarely had anybody that crosses that line, and and if they do, I I would. Sorry that happened to you, by the way. I <laughs> well, here we I've are. had difficulties like that, yeah. never quite like that. But if, if if needed, you know, I'll I'll on a on a break or call a 10 and then yeah uh i'll tell you i'll tell you one other funny story i don't know if it's funny or not but <laughs> you know and i'll go talk to whoever this the person is a yeah. producer director who that might be misbehaving and then i i just have a little heart to heart with them you know yeah. and try to yeah. figure it out but there are times when you're just not going to win and yeah and if somebody's behaving badly sometimes the best thing you can do is just <laughs> see ya <laughs> yeah, you know? well, there's the seasoned veteran in you. You know, I, I certainly um, was not that 20 years ago, but it, it's you know you, you do have to understand how to deal with that kind of thing. And you're right, and and particularly when there's a lot of um, egos in the room, both good and bad. And sometimes they're not even the filmmakers. You know, it, it it might be the significant others of the producers. I mean, you know, we've heard those stories. And me, uh, uh, you know, I try to. I don't know. Maybe it's a subtle thing. You know, I yeah. think it's how you, Yeah. I think when you're on the stand and you, you're such a great conductor, I mean, you know this, but if I'm on a film or a TV show and I'm conducting and there's, let's say there's strife, there's something mm -hmm. going on in the booth. Um, I just learned over the years that um, I can kind of power through it mm -hmm. and work with the orchestra and get a, get a couple takes done. Right. You know, and then get to your 10, get to your break. And then on the break, usually there's, there, yeah. there could be a moment to, yeah. to discuss, but I, I honestly think that everybody should treat each other with respect yeah. and kindness and uh, yeah. goodwill. And when, when they don't, you know, it doesn't have to be that much. Honestly, the only, the funny story is I had to do that one time and I didn't quit or anything like that. What I did was, I was um, doing a picture, I won't say the studio, but we were on the st stage and the director, who was a very nice guy, mm -hmm. uh, we'd done four or five days of recording. We were on the very last day of recording and he hadn't given me a note. He was all week going, yeah, this is great. That's mm. great. You know, and I love it. <laughs> and then on the very last day of recording, I think in the morning, yeah. uh, he said, oh, John, by the way, can we talk about one M one, which is the very first piece of music in the movie. Of course. And he started giving me these like voluminous notes and, and it, it was, you know, yeah. it will have to handle and really quite frankly, not fair of him to wait that long. He just didn't know any better. Sure, I think. Sure. And so I literally, it's the first time I've ever done this and only time I very kindly spoke to, uh, the powers that be. And I think my agent was there mm. and I said, you know, guys, um, I, if you want me to, and, and I said it, I think very diplomatically, I, I told the director, I said, you know, if you'd like me, I, I, I really need to address this, but I need to go back to my studio across the street, which is where I am yeah, now right, right. to, to fix that. And I'd love to fix it, but I, I need time. Mm. You get, so luckily I had a great friend of mine, who was conducting and I said, Pete, take, take over. Mm -hmm. And so I left and it was so funny because I told everybody I was leaving. I said, guys, I'm not quitting. I'm just 
I need yeah. to go across the street. And so I came across the street and it took me about five minutes to make, make the change. And uh, I just didn't go back to the studio next morning, the following morning. Then I went in and everybody was like, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah. And, and I was, I was absolutely fine, but I had to play that one a certain way to just kind of, you know, draw a line in the sand, as it were, but a really in a very nice way. Sure. I said, yeah, everything's great. Blah, 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 blah. Sure. And, but, but I, I, it was a good lesson for me because I, yeah. I realized that sometimes you just have to, you, you don't want to be unkind. You don't want to right. say anything you shouldn't. Right. But you also have to put a line in the sand and go, you know, hey, love to do that. There's no, there's not enough time in the day. I need, to, you know. Yeah. So um, whenever I've had those kind of issues, it's usually pretty easily resolved with a discussion, you know, and I, I'm really thankful, Justin, that I've really never had to deal too much with yeah. difficult personalities. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with strong personalities, Mel being one who I love, mm -hmm. brilliant filmmaker, brilliant actor, um, but it's a process. Right. And sometimes you just get to, you need to get to know someone right, too, right. you know? Anyway, so that's shorthand. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, speaking of, well, um, yeah. you know, kindness and respect, why don't we pivot to 1997's Liar Liar? Um, awesome. You know, when this, this, um, I know we had talked about this a while ago, uh, so correct me if this is, um, you know, uh, uh, not an accurate recapitulation, but um, you had mentioned that you felt that this was a film that was a, a, at the time a very big break for you. And yeah. a wonderful yeah. opportunity, and, and certainly Tom Shadjak, the director, um, an amazing director, this is mm -hmm. filled with so much talent. And the, the scene I wanted to share with folks, just kind of talk about it very, very quickly, is sure. um, this is the first time that Jim Carrey in the courtroom has been forced to tell the truth. He, you know, it's first time where he tried to lie and couldn't. And mm -hmm. and a, a reason I thought we'd share and just talk about this scene, uh, if you wouldn't mind, is just to perhaps comment on the elephant in the room, which in every Jim Carrey movie is Jim Carrey. And yeah. he's such a comedic genius. And so there's a level of, I imagine, as the composer, sensitivity that you need to bring to the scene. You know, and I, I think back to, you know, some of the legendary stories we've heard of Miles Davis, you know, turning to the rhythm section and, you know, saying, you know, I don't need any help there. Um, you know, so what do you do as a composer? Do you, do you help the scene? Do you stay in the background? Do you go over the top? Anyway, so this this scene is is what it is, and I thought it's a it's a very light, fun, um, commas and periods and colons. That maybe is a, is one way to kind of put an end to all this. Fifty percent of your estate. Fifty percent, with a prenup and proof of adultery. What's your case? Our case is simply this. First off, I, I don't know how anyone on the set got through that take with any kind of serious faces, you know. Um, yeah. But, well, you know, you know, <laughs> that's one of my favorite um, films that I've done. Uh, I got to, gosh, uh, Jim Carrey obviously is on his own plane of brilliance. Um, and, and this, of course, was his, uh, God, he was at the height of his powers, you know, and, uh, and that was such a fun movie because some of the musical moments and beats were really there. Most of them, most of them are dictated by, by Jim himself. Hmm. Um, and that one, there was something magical in that movie that it seemed like anything I would write, uh, it would accent things. And then I realized kind of quickly while I was working on it that the reason any music that I would 
right if I got it if I got it in the right tempo, by the way, uh, it would hit with a lot of Jim's uh, antics. Mm. And so I think it was 50 50 50 50 percent of the time it was me trying to sort of see where I would not hit something and other times it was hitting things right on. Um, and, and Tom Shadiak is the master of, uh, comedy really. Yeah, and yeah. so I would try things and sometimes Tom would have me not hit something or accent after an action that Jim did. There, there was no science to it other than I realized early on, Justin, and I, if, if I found the right tempo, you know, mm. Dun, 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 dun. whatever the tempo of the scene felt like to me right. then it was pretty easy to catch actions and and that doesn't happen all the time it's also was was a film that was very well cut don zimmerman yeah fantastic amazing yeah brilliant editor yes. um who did a lot of those films gosh i think i did a number of films with don maybe four or five six films yeah, he's a great editor He's a great editor, and yeah. so are his sons, by the way, the, the next gen. Um, so, you know, some of that stuff was just luck of the draw. There was, there's a great scene where Jim Carrey um, beats himself up in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, that. I do. And once I got the tempo of sort of what he was doing in, in his actions and the way it was cut, uh, it, it Things just hit well. And, and that's, like I said, that's not always the case. In fact, right. it's usually not that way. Mm -hmm. And I always feel if sometimes I'm really having a tough time accenting things, you know, for, for dramatic reasons, there's usually a reason behind it. Either it wasn't cut a certain way or the, the performer wasn't really thinking rhythm with rhythm. Jim thinks of rhythm, right. I think. he's He's always, you know... God, it still cracks me up. And he does that with his teeth. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, but a lot of his movements in that film were were, were um uh fast and frenetic. Yeah. And and my and I don't know, maybe it's a personality thing. I'm kind of again being the ever ready bunny, I, I mean I'm always like <laughs> bubbly and yeah. uh and effervescent, I guess, and that per yeah. Bruce Brown. So you know, I would kind of approach the music like that. And it was sort of a circus like fun time. And once I came up uh, with a couple of ancillary themes, James Newton Howard, good friend of mine, gave me that gift. Uh, he was going to do that film, the whole, the whole film. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've told the story a million times. He had written a lovely, beautiful theme. The main theme is James's theme. And, um, he was going to do it in a schedule change. And I don't know when, what, what other picture he was going to do, but he so kindly, you know, brought me into this thing and met shady. We met at lunch with, with James and shady And I think the editor mm -hmm. and my friend, the music editor, Jeff Carson yeah. and J and H just, you know, put it on a platter for me. Wow. And uh, he had already written a few cues, but he was like, no, you can do this. You can do this, John. You'll kill it. It'll be great. So, you know, I have my, there are two Jameses in my life that I owe my career to. One is James Newton Howard. The other one is James Horner. And I don't know if you know that, but that's the truth. And, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't have had a film career, I think, like that, 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 as it took off, it was really because of those two Jameses, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I, I remember I used to, Newton Howard did that a couple of times for me. And I, I used to send him 
little gifts and things. And one day I sent him another gift for something. And he goes, he called me, he goes, John, you don't have to send me any more gifts. You're, you're so talented. You're, you're, you're doing great. Just, you know, and <laughs> he's just, <laughs> he's such a gracious man. Yeah. And those, those that know him are very lucky to know. Him. Yeah. It's, um, it's great to, to see the collaborative spirit amongst artists, which yeah. is not oftentimes seen visibly because, you know, as you know, you, you live this life where you, you live a very monk-like environment at times because you need to. You need to be yeah. in your studio and be in your mindset and be in the, the, the director's mindset, the film's mindset. And yeah. and and the first time I kind of heard it described as that, a monk-like environment, was actually by John Williams um, when I was really, really young in the late mm. 80s. Uh, I remember seeing an interview of him. I think it was post. He had just finished uh, The Empire Strikes Back, and he had done an interview, I think, you know, from Abbey Road. Anyway, um, this monk-like environment, to steal the phrase from, you know, Maestro yep. Williams. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of that. And, you know, it, it probably right. really no other way, right? I mean, if you're trying to be myopic and narrow and deep on any subject, and you know, whether or not it's composition mm -hmm. or orchestration or conducting or, you know, I'm just staying in the music vein. You, you need to have some of that sleeping under pianos, you know, when you're young and studying. <laughs> well, you know, that's such a great, great statement and in, in question. I, you know, someone asked me recently, you know, a, a week ago, a few days ago, like, how are you dealing with, you know, the quarantine? And I'm, I had to honestly say, fine, I'm, I'm quarantined every day. Right. You know, I'm lucky enough to be in this lovely room and I have my wife works with me, as you know, Justin, and, and, and we have a great team of people around us. Um, so they, I'm cloistered most of the time. I'm like a, I guess I'm like a monk, like you say, I'm a priest or a monk. I'm, <laughs> but I'm lucky enough to do that because I, maybe other people are different, but I have to go really deep. And I, I'm sure you do when you're writing, you have to, you just lose track of time and you get into this zone and you kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if you're lucky, like me, you just pull stuff out of the, you know, <laughs> I, I always say I have a well, you know, like a well with water in it. And I always throw my bucket down and I always think it's going to come up empty, but for whatever reason, sure. ideas come to me and they come to me all at all times of the day and night. And so, Sometimes at night, I related this story recently, you know, I'll get the, my iPhone out and record at two or three in the morning, some little melody that I'm looking for. Sure. Um, but yeah, that, that is kind of the life. Now, people like our friend Hans Zimmer have found a wonderful way to have a collegial mm -hmm. group of people that, you know, work together. And that's, that's fantastic. He's, too. he's an just, incredible collaborator incredible collaborator yeah, speaking yeah. of probably one of the best collaborators yeah um i just don't have that ability he's just he writes his wonderful music and yeah. then and it's so deep and then he has other people that he collaborates with and to great effect so yes absolutely um i'm kind of jealous you know <laughs> i i wish i could do that i do it occasionally um you know if i'm lucky enough to work with somebody yeah. you know an artist or a songwriter yeah. diane warren comes to yeah. mind she's a good friend of ours yeah. and um you know she's she's like me she likes to get in her cave and write and but she's just a wonderful collaborator yeah. too so. Brought to you by Santa Concerts, 